Hey guys, it's Chris at Highline Guitars. You're watching another one of my YouTube guitar building videos. If you're new to my channel, welcome. I hope that by the end of this video, I'll have earned the honor and privilege of your subscription. Lately, I have been on a fret leveling kick, and it's because I did a couple of videos where I talked about some of the pitfalls of using a fret rocker. And whenever I talk about tools like this or fret leveling, I get a lot of questions from folks about the process of leveling. And a question that seems to come up a lot is, should frets be leveled on a straight and flat fretboard? Or should they be leveled simulating neck relief? And that's kind of that's a good question because there are definitely different camps some people who believe that the fretboard should be absolutely level and then others who think you should simulate the effect of string tension or a truss rod adjustment that would result in slightly bowing the neck and creating relief towards the middle of the neck and that would seem to make sense as well. But when you really start to look at it closely, you begin to realize that it's not a simple question to answer. So I'm gonna to try to answer that as best I can in this video. That way in the future, when people pose that question in the comments for my other videos, I can just link them to this video and hopefully it'll answer their question. First of all, let me explain how I level frets. What I do is I make sure that the fretboard is absolutely level and I use a notched straight edge to do that. And I'll put it on the fretboard in the center. And what I'll do is I'll get down and I'll look to see if there are any gaps between this bottom edge of the notched straight edge and the top surface of the fretboard. I can also, if it's not level, especially if it's got a hump in it, you know, I can check to see if, if it's rocking, which in this case it is. This fretboard isn't level. It's got a little bit of a hump in the center. So what I can do to level it is just adjust the truss rod. And you have to do it in slight increments. And then once it stops rocking, I'll check it again to make sure there are no gaps because I don't want to induce gaps I want it to be absolutely level so that each one of these tabs on this notch straight edge are in contact with the surface of that fretboard and it's not rocking. At that stage, I can grab my fret leveling beam and go to town on those frets and get them all level. Then once I'm done and I've crowned and polished them, done all that, I can string up the guitar, set the action, tune the strings, and what I usually will do is I will once again, with the strings on, is I'll grab my notch straight edge and I'll check to see if the string tension has changed the level of the fretboard. And if it has, I can adjust the truss rod to bring it back to being perfectly level. And that's how I do it. Now, there are a lot of folks who prefer to induce that relief. They'll remove the strings. Well, first of all, with the strings on, they'll check with the notch straight edge to see if there's relief, which there typically will be, uh, especially if the player likes to have relief. They sometimes will adjust the truss rod uh, in addition to the string tension to generate that relief. And they'll measure where the maximum amount of relief is using feeler gauges. And they'll record that number. Then they'll remove the strings and once the strings have been removed once again they'll take the notch straight edge and they'll check where that maximum relief is to see if that's changed which in all likelihood it has and they'll adjust the truss rod to induce the relief that is present when the guitar is strung up and in a playing condition then they can grab their leveling beam and level the frets with that, that relief induced. Um, now, sometimes you can't get the relief just by adjusting the truss rod. And in some cases, um, 
the relief isn't consistent. You might have kind of a roller coaster thing going on. That's where the Erlewine uh, string tension simulating neck jig that Stumac sells comes in handy. It can accurately simulate the condition of the neck when it's strung up and ready to play, but without the strings present so that you have access to the frets and can level them in that condition. But there are other folks who believe that what you should do is simulate that relief using the same methods, either by adjusting the truss rod or using the Erlewine neck jig. But then instead of using one of these straight steel precision ground leveling beams, you would use a leveling beam that can be adjusted to uh, conform to that curvature. And that would seem to make sense. And in truth, I, th I totally agree with that approach more so than simulating the relief and using a straight leveling beam. And the reason for that is, if you have simulated the relief, that bow, and you're using a straight leveling beam, as you're leveling the frets, you're leveling the frets relative to the string, but that it's not following the curvature of the neck. So what ends up happening is because of the way the neck bows un under string tension, and contrary to what you may think, it doesn't, the high spots aren't at each end. A lot of people, I think, tend to think that it does sort of a bowl-shaped curve. But in truth, what happens is the string tension is pulling up on the headstock. And since the neck is glued or bolted into the body, the curvature goes up from the body up to the headstock. So it goes from level in this area and it goes up like so. Now, not all of them will do that. Some of them, you get a hump and then it goes into a, a curve that's called an S curve. Uh, it just depends on the, the individual guitar. But uh, typically what is happening, uh, especially since the neck is thinnest in this area, is you're pulling up on that headstock. So if you've got that curve going on and you're using your straight leveling beam and you're grinding along, what's happening is as the, the beam is moving the length of the fretboard, it's in contact with these frets on the end here and on the end here, but it may not necessarily be in contact in the center because of how that bow shape is. So you end up removing a little bit more material from the frets at this end than you do from this end. And in the end, what you, what you get is the height of your fret from the top of the fret to the top of the fretboard is a little bit less on these frets at the end here and not the end here than it is at the center. But they are level on a level plane relative to the strings. That can be a good thing. You won't know, however, until after you've strung up the guitar, set the action, tuned it, uh, adjusted the truss rod if necessary to get the amount of relief that you want, and then play the guitar. If you have issues with buzzing, then you know that that method probably didn't work well for that particular guitar. It may work on other ones, but it may not work on the guitar that you're currently working on. It's kind of a hit and miss. You just never really know. Now, with the leveling beams that can be adjusted to conform to that curvature, what you're ending up doing is you're leveling all the frets so that they are level with respect to the curvature of the neck. Each fret from the top of the fret to the top of the fret board is gonna be the same height, every single one of them. But because the fret board is in that bow going up to the nut, each of the frets, the height is going to conform to the fret board so that when you consider the height of or the level of all the frets, they're not actually level. They're following that bow. And that can be a good thing as well. In fact, that's what I prefer. And I can achieve that with the method that I use. 
because when I level the frets with the fretboard perfectly level, each fret is going to be from the, uh, the same height from the top of the fret to the top of the fretboard. They're all going to be the same height. Then when I string it up and tune it, intonate it, and make you know whatever truss rod adjustment would be necessary to achieve the amount of relief that the end user is going to want, those frets are doing basically the same thing in terms of their height as if I were to um, level the frets using an adjustable fret leveling beam while the strings are on and that relief has been induced naturally. So what would be the advantage of using one of those adjustable beams? And the beam that comes to mind, it's really the only one that I know of out there that can be adjusted to conform to that curvature, to that bow, is the Katana from Rectify Masters. Now, I've never actually used it myself. I know some others who have, and it does pretty much exactly what it says. But since I'm in a workshop setting and I'm building guitars and I, I, I have the time, I can remove the strings, level the, the neck, level the frets, and then, you know, do all my crowning and all that. And then once I've strung it up and um, it induced a little bit of relief, I can either leave it or I can adjust it to make it level again before I send the guitar off. But I'm accomplishing the exact same thing. And... Um, this, this tool, this steel fret leveling beam, they're a lot easier to find. They're less expensive um, than the uh, Katana from Rectify Masters. However, I really think the uh, Katana definitely has its place because for a lot of guys who are, especially professional musicians who are traveling the country, going on tours or traveling the world, uh, going to studios in different cities, taking different guitars with them. You may find yourself in situations where when you play the guitar, you've also all of a sudden got a ridiculous amount of uh, string buzz that you need to deal with right away. And you don't have time to pull all the strings off, to level the fretboard, to grab your fret leveling tool, to <laughs> start leveling, doing all that work that you would normally do or have a luthier do in a workshop. You've got to do something right away. Well, you can take that katana, you can put it on the guitar, and you can adjust it until it conforms to the natural curvature of the neck, level the frets, and you're good to go. It's so much faster and so much easier. So I think uh, for musicians in situations like that, the katana would be an indispensable tool. And that's what I would recommend doing. Um, uh, I think it just uh, would be a godsend for a lot of guitarists. But like I said, I've never used the tool myself, so uh, I can't totally vouch for it. But just looking at the tool and hearing what other people have said about it, uh, I think that it would be a, a, a good addition to the professional traveling musicians uh, toolkit that he takes with him. So um, I hope all this makes sense. It gets kind of confusing. Um, and, you know, that's the whole thing about fret leveling. The, the, the biggest takeaway, I think, is that what works for one guitar isn't necessarily going to work for another guitar. And that's part of the skill of a luthier is knowing when to use a technique that uh, might work for one guitar, but then maybe adapting another technique or using another technique for another guitar, it can get kind of confusing. And I think what happens is you have to be able to examine the condition of the fretboard with your notch straight edge before you do anything and check to see what's going on. Is it, is it got a hump in it? Is it got back bow, up bow, an S bow? What is it doing? And from there, you can kind of make the determination as to what technique you think is going to work best for getting the fretboard level. But I personally keep it simple. And I just level the fretboard, then level the frets, then string it up, tune it, um, and then I'll adjust the truss rod if necessary to ensure that the fretboard stays level. 
But then what that means is if the guitarist who's going to eventually play it decides they want to induce some relief because they prefer to have relief, uh, they're going to have to work with a luthier to adjust that uh, neck to get the relief they want and then possibly do some spot leveling in order to eliminate any string buzz that might occur as a result of inducing that relief. So um, I hope this all makes sense and I hope it uh, gives you some food for thought. And if you have any comments or questions, be sure to post them down below and I or somebody else in the community will do our best to try to answer. And as always, um, if you did enjoy this video, please give it a thumbs up. That is so important to YouTubers like myself. It's a great way to show support without having to spend any money and it helps this video reach more people and it just builds that whole community of guitar builders that we can all benefit from. And if you want to take your uh, support to the next level, maybe chip in a few bucks to help support the channel, you can visit my eGuitar Plans web store or my Highline Guitars merch store. There's links in the description below. And any purchase that you make on those sites is going to help support my channel so that I can keep making these videos, building guitars, and taking you along on the journey so that we can all learn. And if you'd like to chip in and just want to keep it simple, you can just click that thanks button and leave a tip in the amount that you think is fair. And you can include a question if you want, because if you ask a question and include a tip, I'm going to definitely answer that question. So until the next episode, as always, take care, stay safe, and I hope you'll be back for more guitar building videos.